Few acts in filmmaking history have been tougher to follow than Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. It was an unimpeachable instant classic on release, beloved by die-hard Spider fans and stuffy film critics alike. And while at first it only modestly exceeded Sony's expectations at the box office, it would go on to have the best December ever for any animated movie based purely on the strength of that word of mouth. On release, I called it the ultimate Spider-Man movie, and I stand by that statement, though it's got some stiff competition now. What's more, it completely changed the game for CG animation as arguably the last step in bridging the uncanny valley between 2D and 3D that anime studios have been struggling to cross for decades now. Every CGI thing that's come out of Japan since Beastars, basically, is part of a greater conversation between Spider-Verse and Land of the Lustrous. And from Arcane to Puss in Boots The Last Wish to the new TMNT, almost every single animated thing Hollywood has done in the last five years, stop motion Pinocchio not with standing owes its existence to that one incredible movie. Into the Spider-Verse set new bars for animation, superhero films, and Spider-Man adaptations all at the same time. And after keeping fans waiting for five years, which is longer than that first groundbreaking movie spent in development, the sequel needed to raise all of those bars and more to prove its worth as a successor. And you probably don't need me to tell you that they pulled it off. Across the Spider-Verse opened to $120 million domestic, plus $80 million international, demolishing not only the record of its prequel, but every summer movie this side of Super Mario Bros. this year. There's a very good chance that you've seen this movie and know how very good it is already, so I won't bother being coy with spoilers as we dive into analyzing it. If you're still holding off, though, the short version is the writing is cleverer than ever, the direction of big action scenes and low-key moments alike will likely take your breath away, and they might just have changed the entire landscape of animation again. So, you know, go see it. Now. But if you have already, or you just really want to hear me talk it up before you do, then pull up with an ice-cold waifu cup of Gamersup's new and improved lemonade flavor, 10% off at gamersups.gg basement, and it comes with a free prism cup while supplies last, which is... That's Spider-Verse colors. Smooth, Jeff. Seamless integration. And let me tell you why Spider-Verse might just be the best Spider-Man thing ever made again. Now, you may have noticed I neglected to mention the fan service aspect of the package when I gave you the short version just now, but with a pitch like, Wait, 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 hold on. The Mona Lisa. There's an elite society with all the best spider people in it? I figure it goes without saying this new movie was always gonna go even harder in that respect. Both Spider-Verse films are love letters to the many different iterations of this character and his many different fans around the world. But where the first one was broadly written, using a small, carefully selected squad of diverse Spider's men to selectively represent the near-infinite variations on the character within a reasonable CGI film budget, from goofy tunes to angry angsty teens to grim dark noir badasses. This new letter is almost obsessively hyper-specific, taking pains to address dozens of variations on the character in its main text alone, with countless little notes scribbled throughout all the margins to ensure that no Spider-Men are left behind. If you've ever been a fan of any kind of Spider-Man or woman from film, TV, comics, video games, or toys, be they an amazing, spectacular, ultimate, unlimited, Insomniac HD on PS4, Neversoft Low Poly on PS4, one, Parker Bros 8-bit on Atari, or animated at 5 frames per second with a goofy yet impossibly catchy theme song in the 60s Spider-Man, there will be a moment in this movie that makes you say, I understood that reference. Unless your Spider-Man of choice was MTV CGI Spider-Man, but he's technically supposed to be Raimi vs. Spider-Man anyway, and he does appear here in all his live-action glory alongside Andrew Garfield's Spidey and Donald Glover as Tom Holland's Prowler, so I think I can let that one slide. The presence of even live-action Spider-Man feels like a natural extension of Into the Spider-Verse's propensity for blending animation styles to depict the clash of its multiverses, which 
as an animation nerd, was one of my favorite things about the original film. And this sequel takes that aspect in particular to a whole other level. For starters, the action's no longer confined to the stylistically samey worlds of Miles and a little bit of Peter B. Parker. This film truly takes us across the Spider-Verse, from Spider-Gwen's washed out neon watercolor world to a vibrant Silver Age comic scape to a land of Lego and far beyond. Of those, the loosely inked, vividly colorful art inspired by the Indian comics imprint ACK Comics that makes up Pavitar Prabhakar's Mumbatan is probably my personal favorite, which is great because we get to enjoy quite the extended action scene there. Though that's definitely a matter of personal preference. The Sid Mead-inspired futurism of Miguel O'Hara's Nueva York looks just as gorgeous. In an interview with Empire, Phil Lord said the film's ambition is to wow you every time you enter a new environment, and they can proudly proclaim that mission accomplished. Personally, I was wowed almost every time I saw a new character, because the film gets so wildly creative with how its different styles blend. Gwen's first major fight is against a Renaissance-era vulture who looks like he literally jumped off the page of a Da Vinci sketchbook. When Spectacular Spider-Man shows up, he's animated exactly like the original show. PS1 Spider-Man is just a background gag, but they took the time to make sure he was animated on ones, like a too smooth video game character to stand out from the on twos animated crowd. Far and away though, the spider guy who steals the show is without doubt Hobie Brown, the fash bash and spider punk of Earth 138. And he steals it in every sense, not just visually, although holy crap, from a visual standpoint, the way he's animated, like a cutout collage from a DIY punk zine come to life, different styles bashing together and shifting on every frame, refusing to quietly blend into any world you stick him in, is nothing short of breathtaking. Supposedly, it took three of the five years this film's been in the works to get Hobie's look right, and if you ask me, that was time well spent. And not just because I'm personally extremely biased toward his particular brand of basedness. I mean, yeah, from the moment he quipped that an all-consuming void in the fabric of reality was a metaphor for capitalism, I knew Hobie'd be my personal fave, just like Lemon's my new fave Flav. Mmm delicious irony. But no matter what your political leanings may be, by the time this movie's through, you will find it all but impossible not to cheer for the charismatic arachnid anarchist. How are you even cooler under your mask? I was just cool the whole time. Hobie's so cool, you can hardly blame Miles for getting a little worried when he first hears about him that he might be losing his girl Gwen to him. Particularly after hearing that she's been crashing in his dimension, which I want to see animated so badly in the next movie, oh my god. But it takes just a few moments of Spider-Punk's screen presence for him to dispel that worry through vibes alone, especially as he stands in contrast to the natural-born fuckboy that is Spider-Man India. Hobie is quite clearly just looking out for his drummer, like a good punk rocker should, and he's just as happy to offer sage advice to Miles, both practical, like how he should use his full palm if he ever needs to dispel a force field with his Venom Shock, a power that this version of Hobie also seems to have, and spiritual, like how he shouldn't enlist, even in an army of rad multi-dimensional spider people, until he actually knows what he'll be fighting for. I mean, he does already know the broad strokes. Miguel O'Hara, Spider-Man 2099, is using all his fancy future tech to clean up the mess that was made of the multiverse in the last movie, which it's also implied is partly the fault of the events of No Way Home. His elite spider Spider Squad finds and stops anomalies, villains who've slipped through the super collider cracks into the wrong realities to wreak havoc, from tearing all of existence asunder. With his power to cross worlds through the portals on his body, Miles' new villain of the week, The Spot, created in the super collider explosion at the end of the last film and motivated by the time that Miles hit him in the head with a bagel slightly before that, could be the most dangerous anomaly of all. Hence why Gwen is sent to sort him out and finally comes to visit Miles along the way. But there is a reason why she couldn't visit sooner, and she hesitates to let Miles get too close when she does. See, the specific way these villains can destroy worlds is by messing with the Spider-Man canon, a series of 
fixed events whose consistency across the lives of all spider people shapes their fates and binds their worlds together. Things like Uncle Ben getting riced, Jameson riding their asses. In every other universe, Gwen Stacy falls for Spider-Man. And in every other universe, it doesn't end well. Yeah, that's a big one. But most significant to this movie's plot is the plot point of a police captain they care about getting pancaked in the line of duty. Which, in Miles' case, obviously means his dad, and also that's not supposed to happen for two more days, so he wasn't supposed to find out about the whole Spider Squad thing until at least then. And now that he has, Miguel thinks he's gotta lock him up to stop him from stopping that for the good of the multiverse. Especially since any changes that Miles makes would theoretically be like double anomalies because the radioactive spider that bit him came from another dimension where it was supposed to bite someone else. It's kind of a messy theory with a lot of holes in it, but I, I think that's the point since Miguel's the antagonist. Of course, Miles isn't just gonna lie down and take all that, so he fights back, not just against Miguel, but almost every other spider person there in that wild and bombastic chase scene that I know you've at least seen some of in the trailer. But even if you have seen the full thing in theaters, you probably don't fully appreciate just what a feat that scene is. I don't think anyone outside the studio that made it really can until this thing comes out on Blu-ray and us Sakuga nerds are able to pour over it frame by frame. Because not only is it quite possibly the coolest web-slinging sequence ever put on film, but every last unique Spider-Man, woman, cat, T-Rex and Monkey in it slings their webs and moves in a wholly unique way. It's an awe-inspiring feat of animation that ensures even the most blink and you miss em cameos have their own distinct identity. But of course, moving pictures are worth thousands upon thousands of words, which leaves plenty of room to sneak all that characterization onto the screen. So, in a sense, it's far more impressive that the film manages to balance, like, two dozen distinctly voiced spider people, plus the regular people and supervillains around them, while still following a clean, coherent, and clearly defined arc in its 150-ish page script. If Across the Spider-Verse is any one of these many spider people's story, it's not Miles, actually, but Gwen's. The narrative of the greater trilogy is still very much focused on our boy in black, and he does reach some important milestones here, particularly in his relationship with his mom, but he and most of his plot threads need to be left dangling, literally, at the film's end, so beyond the Spider-Verse can pick them up and tie them all together. So Gwen's arc of outing herself to her dad, running away, and ultimately reconciling with him ends up being the webbing that holds the film together as a structurally sound, if not quite standalone, story, allowing it to leave you feeling satisfied even as it ends on that nail-biting cliffhanger. She fills the role in a subtle, understated way, to be sure, both because she's got a lot of spider folk to share screen time with, and because she's just not one for opening up in general, but the beats of that arc clearly bookend each of the film's acts, and it's through her that the change in spider society that Miles acts as a catalyst for is first felt. Well, Hobie gives him a push first, but the spider punk was never really part of Miguel's whole regime to begin with. Now what's really clever about all this is that at the start of the film, it really seems like Gwen is gonna fill the role of a catalyst for change in Miles' life again the way that she did in the first movie. As we're reintroduced to his character, we see clear signifiers in his strained relationship with his parents, especially Jeff, and him running late for a very important meeting about his future at Princeton, that he's struggling to juggle his life and superheroing, and with how much he's pining for her, it sure seems to us and him like Gwen is the one who's gonna have all the answers to that. And when she first arrives, it sure seems like she knows a lot more than him, specifically about the whole multiverse thing, which is the main thing that he wants to go to Princeton to study in the first place, precisely so he can see her again. And his other pals, I guess, but I don't see Spider-Ham all over his sketchbook. The more time we and she spend with him, though, the clearer it becomes that Miles has mostly got it figured out. Look at you. Look at me. 
Miles has grown up a lot since the last movie. He's mostly got a handle on the whole crime fighting thing, embarrassing scuffles with the spot notwithstanding. He knows what he wants to do with his life, where he wants to be, and who he wants to be with. Sure, he irresponsibly ducks out of the parent-teacher meeting not two minutes after getting there, but he gives his low-key kind of racist teacher exactly what she's looking for, a narrative she can sell to Princeton admissions before he ducks out. All things considered, he's probably right that he'd be fine if his dad just trusted him and gave him space to grow. But the sticking point there is he doesn't quite trust his folks enough to let them in on the secret that they both know he's keeping. And as long as he's hiding the truth behind his mask, they'll never be able to reach that understanding. That's the one big hurdle he still needs to grow to overcome. And because Rio and Jeff are their own people, not Ben and Mae Parker or Captain Stacy, no one else in the Spider-Verse can really help him get through it. The doubt Gwen sows based on her own experience with her dad does the opposite of help, and Miguel wants to keep him captive until the chance to tell his dad the truth is just gone forever, all because of his dicey theory that smushed police captains are an essential ingredient in the glue that holds the multiverse together. A fate that Gwen has just accepted for herself and her dad, because telling herself some stuff just can't be helped and things gotta be the way they be is easier than being open with and true to herself and living with the consequences. But thanks to Miles' growth in the last film and the last year and change he's spent proving himself, when he gets to this place he's always wanted to be, full of amazing people he's always wanted to be like, and they tell him that he needs to accept the unacceptable to be accepted among them, he has the confidence to stand up and say, Everyone keeps telling me how my story is supposed to go. Nah. I'm gonna do my own thing. Which pushes Gwen to stand up in her own way, putting her in a place where she can finally face her dad. It helps that Miles combines that confidence with the competence to kick every last spider butt standing between him and his way home. Even badass cyber ninja vampire spider butts who clearly represent the selectively canon-obsessed dingbat fans who refuse to accept Miles as Spider-Man IRL. Not that him kicking that butt will actually do anything to change those minds because, I mean, you can guess where that opinion actually comes from. I don't want to get too meta in this review, though, and thankfully, Across the Spider-Verse shares that priority. It certainly has a lot to say about the rigid canonization of the whole Spider-Man mythos, and like the last film, it speaks to what all of these Spider-Men and women and Cat and T-Rex and Monkey mean to the world and culture that surrounds them. It also asks if the trauma of the Spider-Man story is really essential to what makes him a hero. But those elements are ultimately here to serve the characters and their development, not the other way around. Which is where I see a lot of seemingly similar meta-narratives fall flat. And now that I say that out loud, that's kind of the single most vital aspect that unites pretty much every Lord and Miller production, from Clone High to Jump Street to the Lego movies, firmly on the good side of the meta-story spectrum. In the first Spider-Verse, the universal aspects of the Spidey lifestyle, the bite, the dead uncle, the leap of faith, were all there to shape the trajectory of Miles' character arc in a way that simultaneously helped us understand what the other heroes around him had already been through. It was an extremely useful shorthand to keep the development of what might otherwise have been a very bloated cast feeling impressively lean. And in the sequel, the canon does keep filling that role, but now Miles' relationship with it has become inverted. It's no longer a useful guideline for his development as a hero, but rather a track that his life is stuck on that he needs to derail if he wants to carve out his own path and protect what's important to him. And by comparing that to how other spider people respond to this concept of canon, we can understand their characters better too in contrast to Miles. Miguel is, of course, all in on the idea, because with all the loss he's experienced in his regular life as Spider-Man, plus the new troubles he made for himself by actually following through on Kingpin's plan to grab a family from another dimension in the last movie, the idea that there's this 
immutable order to the multiverse and his suffering has a purpose in holding it all together brings him a lot of comfort. Putting himself above all the other Spider-Men, literally with that slow elevator gimmick, as the only one who really knows what must be done is a self-righteous way for Miguel to find company for his misery while feeling like he's fulfilling that purpose. Other older Spider-Men who've already experienced most of their loss probably take a similar comfort in being part of spider society, though some are clearly more cynical about it than others. And then I looked at my uncle and- Uh, let me guess. He died? With the younger generation who are just coming into their great responsibilities though, like Pavita and Gwen, while they may intellectually accept that they gotta watch a building fall on a cop for the good of the space-time continuum or whatever, emotionally, they want to see that cop saved. Hence why Pavita is so relieved when his girlfriend's dad doesn't get squished, and why Gwen lets Miles save him despite knowing the risks. A big part of her still wants to believe that her dad and and their relationship can be saved, and that other parts of her potential fate, like what happens to Gwen Stacy's who get romantically involved with Spider-Man, might not be fixed either. Hobie's kind of an outlier among the young folk in that he absolutely does not give a shit about any cops he knows getting smushed, so he has no real personal objection to working with Miguel, but once his new pal Miles rebels against the system, with a tiny bit of instigation on his part, that's all the motivation he needs to say fuck you, I quit. At the same time, a few of the older spider folk, notably the ones with kids, aren't as convinced as they tell themselves they are either. At first, Jessica Drew seems to be the most committed out of anyone to the mission as Miguel's right-hand woman, but she also clearly wants to give her protege Gwen some leeway when she makes mistakes, and she's not the only mentor who thinks that way. At the start, Peter B. Parker is also fully on board with Miguel's plan, having seen firsthand what can happen when a world falls apart, but he's clearly not convinced that the canon is totally set in stone the way Miguel is. I mean, meeting Miles sent his life on a totally different path. He's got a spider-powered kid now who never would have existed without him jumping dimensions, and Earth 616B doesn't seem like it's going anywhere because of that, and he seems to agree with the wife he has now, also thanks to Miles, when she says, quote, there's no guidebook for being someone like you. At the very least, he probably doesn't want to think that his daughter's fate needs to be cosmically bound to tragedy for the universe to hold together. And when push comes to shove and the kids who look up to them commit themselves to defying their fates, both mentors choose to look the other way, in hopes that better things might be possible for the next generation. Then we have Ben Riley, who's... Uh, too busy brooding to really think about any of that. By tying all of its frankly, too many characters up in that same narrative web, making them all wrestle with the same tough question, come to different answers, and ultimately reach new ones with a bit of prodding from Miles, the film is able to imbue that massive cast with a great amount of depth and variety without needing to take time away from the development of its two main leads or slow down the bombastic roller coaster ride from action scene to astoundingly animated action scene. So when Gwen Gwen rolls up on Earth-42 with the whole squad from the first film using Hobie's DIY multiverse portals, we already understand how all those spider people probably reached that point without having to see their individual journeys to defying the canon. The focus on all these heroes does leave the central villain of the trilogy as little more than an extremely funny running joke who suddenly becomes very much not a joke about 10 seconds before he exits stage right, but Miguel works more than well enough as an antagonist in the spot's temporary absence, and I'm sure beyond the Spider-Verse we'll have a grand old time filling in that literal awkward outline of a bad guy with his own thematic depth and purpose, beyond fueling extremely funny animation sight gags, I mean. I have a feeling that many viewers will write Across the Spider-Verse off as a weaker story than its predecessor, and maybe even its sequel, because it cuts off on that cliffhanger with so many of its biggest ideas left unresolved. Not to mention, after dropping one huge new idea that's just begging to be explored both in the next movie and by other video essayists who can hopefully speak to the experience of 
black youth with more knowledge than myself, but in terms of how it's scripted and directed, I honestly think this movie is much tighter and denser than the first one. And that's absolutely crazy to me, because Into the Spider-Verse was one of the top 10 most tightly written and best directed movies of all time. Like Roger Rabbit and Scott Pilgrim, I'd say it's as close to perfect as films get. But somehow, with the exception that one of the densest and most satisfying two hours I've ever spent in the theater didn't run a full four hours for the sake of closure, Across the Spider-Verse somehow comes even closer than that in every area that counts. I guess if you put a gun to my head and demanded I levy a criticism at the film, I'd say that while it's still great, nothing from the Metro Boomin' soundtrack got immediately stuck in my brain the way What's Up Danger, Sunflower, and Start a Riot did, which might just be a result of this film leaning more on its extremely good orchestral score to punctuate its action, but it might also just be because I haven't had as much time to loop that soundtrack on Spotify over this last weekend. Time will ultimately tell with that one, I guess. In the meantime, though, if you haven't seen the movie already, I hope this has convinced you that you need to at your earliest convenience. And if you have, since we're all in the same boat of waiting for the next one somehow even more desperately than we were waiting for this one now, I would love to read your thoughts on this movie and speculation about its sequel in the comments down below. I'm Jeff Thu, professional Spider-Fan, reminding you that anyone can wear the mask. Ask.